It's only entertainment. All right, welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're gonna look at Planet 13. There was a viewer that wanted to uh, have us dive into Planet 13. At the very end, I'm gonna do a little technical analysis. This is not financial advice, uh, but we are gonna look at Planet 13, looking at their pitch deck in general. We're gonna rate this uh, out of seven, our typical seven uh, points or seven criteria to successful investment deck. Number one, will Planet 13 identify their business plan goals? Number two, do they know their audience? Number three, are they going to understand the market? Four, will they identify needs and roadblocks? Number five, is Planet 13 going to tell us what sets them apart from all the other MSOs? Six, will they introduce the team and products? And number seven, will they create a summary? Let's find out. I'm excited about this, Josh. Planet 13 is huge in Vegas. Brand new. Apparently, they've had uh, the best sales that they've had in a while, but again, you're gonna to have to go to the very end and check out that unless they tell us in the pitch deck. 74% of Americans prioritize their experience over products. Uh, yes, I would say price and convenience are the two factors that get people to go and buy something. But if the experience isn't worth uh, having over again, then they're not gonna go back. Definitely think that this is about experience, whether it's a restaurant or a pre-roll. Agreed. All right. So in Nevada, they have two locations. Um, in California, they've got um, one already in Santa Ana. They're going to open up another one. They have in-house brands with three cultivation facilities and production facilities available in over 45 retail locations. So this is a superstore cannabis entertainment complex. <laughs> Uh, they made $63 million in revenue in 2019. They had over a million visitors. 9% of Nevada's total cannabis sales came from, what, these, this store? Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, if, if it was cannabis, that's too low, but that seems too high for one store. So that's, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, well positioned in the Las Vegas market, closest dispensary to the heart of the Las Vegas Strip. So some of the other attractions, they got a coffee shop and restaurant. There's an um, experiential um, in-house production. I have no idea what that means. Uh, interactive experiences. So kind of get high and go do some fun stuff. That sounds mm -hmm. cool. Might have to do that for MJ BizCon coming up in October. Might have to make this a stop. So they're building momentum, uh, looking at uh, 2020 third quarter, um, wanted to get 22.8 million, maybe. Um, I mean, they were devastated by the lockdown. So the massive amount of lack of tourism dramatically affected their sales. But uh, just recently, so when this deck was published in March of 2021, there was a huge resurgence in Florida. You saw that with spring break <laughs> uh, and in, in Vegas as well. So people want to get out. They want to go into sunny spots, but they were hurt, I think, for a long period during that lockdown. Yeah, absolutely, Josh. Vegas was hit hard. So growing portfolio of in-house brands with wholesale, they've increased cultivation. Uh, they've got vertical integration, which is great wholesaling to 45 dispensaries with multiple SKUs across categories in the top 10 uh, product categories with in-house brands made up of 25% of their superstore sales. I really like this slide, Josh. I like the fact that they are producing their own product and selling it to other stores. That's very smart. Yeah, you don't really see that too much in Colorado. They're vertically integrated, but they kind of keep everything to their own stores. So I like seeing um, diversity. I want to see a, a broad range of SKUs. I think 2000 SKUs is a lot in Washington State. It's hard to see and find stuff. So there's going to be a happy medium at some point. But it's really interesting to kind of see uh, each individual states and, and stores and how they operate. So Nevada's objectives for this year uh, they want to maintain 8 to 10% share of cannabis sales and leverage their production facility and cultivation um, and gain, you know, more market share. <laughs> mm -hmm. Compounded yeah. annual growth rate of 17%. It's not bad. Yeah. All right. So in California, I'm going to try and 
copy that same platform, open up in uh, Orange County by, I guess, right around now. They want to launch a home delivery program, which is going to be essential. A lot of people during that lockdown in California kind of converted over to that. You can see that from a lot of reports where minimum purchases in the stores dropped uh, a little bit to $60, $65, which is the minimum order for delivery. So they're going to have to get on board with that really quick, which kind of goes away from their whole store experience. So that'll be interesting to see how that uh, cultural shift or change happens in, in Cali or that adoption. So Planet 13, Orange County, 55,000 square feet. So that's a really good conversion or future opportunity for a cannabis cafe, kind of like they mentioned before, or some kind of experience. If they want to create like an Instagram museum for people to get high and take selfies, that's a great way for self-promotion. I know that they charge an exorbitant amount for uh, end caps. So you walk into a store and it's around $50,000 to commit to an end cap in Planet 13. Uh, so they're doing traditional uh, supermarket store style sales and promotions that come with <laughs> Fortune 100 pricing. <laughs> exactly. Neighborhood retail concept. They have some experiences in base retail uh, and the smaller store packaging receiving a higher percentage of in-house brand sales than superstore locations. That's interesting. Maybe it's a personalization. Yeah. Or it's the bud tenders driving it, driving the customers to their product. Mm. Yeah. That's I nice don't know one. what to buy. Oh, try this. Right. Yeah. Versus maybe just the, the big superstores as the tourists come in and saying, I need to pre-roll and I'm out. Right. Yeah. All right. So they want to get to Seattle. That'll be interesting in Portland. Actually, they kind of want to get everywhere. Uh, Minneapolis, Miami. Open more neighborhood stores and attractive markets. Mm. They want eight superstore uh, opened up across the U.S. One of those is going to be Portland, not Seattle. So San Francisco and L.A., Atlanta, uh, Detroit, Toronto. Portland, those all have superstores, 55,000 square feet. You know, Josh, what was interesting about that slide was how they determine where to go. Uh, if a city is affluent enough to support a major sports team, then they're affluent enough to support a Planet 13 superstore. Um, that, that's a very interesting tidbit. Yeah, that, that's good. And yet I would say that Seattle is far more affluent than Portland. Uh, we don't have the basketball team yet, but I think Portland's cannabis culture um, is, is far ahead of ours. There's more licenses, far more licenses. So the products are a lot cheaper, more availability. They, they don't have the classy felony on consumption lounges that we do. Uh, so it's an interesting choice to go to Portland. Um, that tells me that they understand the market locally more than somebody else who would just be like, oh, yeah, Seattle, they have Microsoft. Um, when you're on the ground, you realize that Portland would be a better choice than Seattle. Yeah, it's very, very good. So they're supported by fully aligned management, strong balance sheet. Um Revenues look pretty solid year over year. That's a that's a pretty substantial increase. But again, they're opening new stores. So this is not same store sales. Um, kind of hard to gauge what that looks like. But they did have a net income, positive net income in 2020. So that's phenomenal. Uh, when you look at, at a competitor like MedMen, like they don't know what profitability is, or they didn't, I should say. That is my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, by the way, MedMen CEOs are getting sued because they, they were supposed to use those $26 million mansions that, you know, every entrepreneur has. They were supposed to use that as collateral and they didn't. So go figure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Um, they got a little bit of uh, cash or uh, actually that's negative, a little bit of debt. But so a lot of these cannabis companies, this is, this is a really solid balance sheet because a lot of these cannabis companies have to be... Um, in the US rather, they have to they have to manage their funds better. You go up to Canada, not so much publicly traded, they're writing stuff off left and right. But here, I think this looks um, fairly solid from what I can see. Inside ownership is only 45%, that's still pretty good. 
does show the board of directors and management. They have a CFO. That's important. <laughs> yes. Um, former look, city. Go ahead. Look at the qualifications of, of the management. Right. Uh, a former mayor, a former uh, city councilor, somebody with 17 years in investment banking. Um, the, these are these individuals did not come from the basement grow black market uh, into this industry. Uh, the, these, these individuals are highly qualified to run a multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not to say that the grower doesn't know what they're doing about, you know, cultivation, about, you know, different um, strains or cultivars, but you got to learn how and when to get out of your own way. Uh, founder syndrome, you'll put roadblocks and you'll just fail and stumble. But you, if you want to get to the scale of these guys and get to, you know, the market cap that they're about to, you got to get out of your own way, put yourself in a board position and hire folks that know more than you. I always want to be the dumbest person in the room. Every time I, I want to hire people that are always smarter. And if your ego gets in the way, um, you know, you're going to be watching from the sidelines and saying, oh, I, I could have been one of Microsoft's first employees or whatever the, you know, the excuse is. But um, back to the management and board, uh, there's vice presidents of operations and finance and marketing and production. Um, and you can dive into them on, on LinkedIn, but it looks like a solid, solid core. Josh, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost your, your screen share. Oh. I'm seeing the Zoom screen. When did that happen? Um, right after the board slide. Oh, weird. Is it back? Uh, yes, thank you, okay. Yeah, so this one. All right. So back to management, board of directors, um, solid folks, not any women though. Um, there's looks like some looks like a minority, um, just a lot of, a lot of older white guys, I guess. It's where the money is, Josh. Yeah, we do have a female board member. Uh, that's good. Cool. Um, so going on to some of the products that they've got, they've got some extracts and vapes and concentrates, you know, all that good stuff that they should, as well as uh, edibles, both gummies and beverages, some of their uh, flower vape concentrate brands, uh, as well as more chocolate edibles, still only in the looks like 10 milligram chunks. Mm -hmm. Pre-rolls, of course, really popular, unless you're in a conservative spot like Arizona, where you might have more vape. Um, but I think Nevada sells a ton of pre-rolls. Well, that's the tourism. Mm -hmm. And so that is it. They end with our, their tinctures and topicals, bath bombs and gummies. Um, speaking of bath bombs, there was a meme that is it truly a legal regulated marketplace when you have a limit on bath bombs and not tequila? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if they made the seven. Yes. So number one, did they identify the business plan goals? Yes, they want to grow. All right. Did they know their audience? I agree. Uh, they put a lot of information that investors want to know uh, in their pitch deck. And they also gave a lot of tidbits that I'm surprised they disclosed. But yes, Josh, they get a full point. And how about uh, number three, do they understand the market? Yes, I do think that they understand the market. Uh, they talked about their market share and how they can increase their market share. Uh, I also really like the focus on the customer experience because, you know, Nordstrom is having the same problem, just get people in the store. Uh, so yeah, I do believe they get a point for that too, Josh. I really liked how they were going to Portland, the super stores, 55,000 square feet. I find interesting. However, not if they're building, if they can find a Sam's club or a Lowe's or something like that and convert, I think there's massive amounts of opportunity. If they're spending money to buy real estate and construction right now, I think that's a terrible time to do it at all time highs. Look for defunct facilities and reinvent that into maybe a cannabis co-working space. 
or um, you know, cafe or an Instagram experience. But um, I think it should be done appropriately. And it looks like they are being wise with their with their money. Uh, yeah. So identifying needs and roadblocks. This is where they sort of stumbled a little bit, in my opinion. I did not see any disclosure, discussion, asterisks about difficulties of going into California. I did not see any any information about their plan to grow into these other um, other cities and other states and what obstacles they face. They did say they have to buy a license, so they did not uh, lie about the fact that it's easy to get into these states. Uh, but I just did not see a lot of needs and roadblocks, Josh. Um, I, I just that that was a failure on the on their part. Yeah, I'd have to give him a zero on that as well. If um, you're expanding into a state like California that is doing majority online and your whole culture is about in-store, you need to kind of express how you're going to get those people to come back out. Uh, if you're going to go into Portland, you need to you know, talk about how you're going to utilize the, um, the cafe experience or that the social media experience. Um, so I would have wanted to see a little bit more about how they were going to work out some of those those kinks um, with some cafes or or just getting people out of the door again. Um, so yeah, I think that was a missed opportunity. Um, in terms of what sets the business apart from any other multi-state operator, uh, I think I think just the superstore experience is right off the bat. But that's kind of a Nevada thing too. There's other stores that are doing or trying to do that. California probably will try to implement that too. You have Hitman Coffee Shop. You have what used to be called Lowell's. Um, so there's three, four different people in there trying to have that experience. But whether or not they can create the store first and then the experience, whole nother story. Right. And, and I think that the, the reason they get half a point for Know What Sets the Business Apart is they talked about verticalization. They cross sell to their competitors. Uh, they have a variety of brands of both cannabis and non-cannabis products uh, with their CBD line. So they're touching all of the, all of the sale points. Um, but I do think their basic business model is to go to tourist centers. Uh, their location in California is, is near Disneyland, for example. And I think short term, that's a great strategy. But at this point, the majority of the states in the United States allow cannabis in one way, shape or form. And the tourist aspect, the trying it for the first time aspect is going away. So if you don't have something to bring in your local customers, like a cannabis consumption lounge, for example, or um, new and better experiences uh, that uh, change on the regular to bring your local customer base, you're not gonna do very well once the, the uh, newness of cannabis wears off. And, and I do believe that it is wearing off uh, more and more with each passing day. So I'm gonna give them a half a point for uh, know what sets their business apart, Josh. Mm -hmm. And then number six, introducing the team, which they did, and uh, the product being 13, uh, Planet 13, as well as some of their, uh, their products. So it looks like they, they did that. They, they did very well here. Um, I, I like to be able to Google the people that are involved with the company and look them up myself, and I can do so. And they had a variety of products that I can also Google. And uh, this is a real company. This isn't a, an idea or a plan. They're operational. Um, and I would have liked to see sales of their various products. Uh, you know, so uh, they have a whole bunch of sales, but what products are they selling? And uh, is the CBD brand driving their sales or is it the pre-rolls? Uh, uh, other than that, uh, I, I, I really like um, their um, team and product uh, elements of the slide deck. Uh, so I'm going to give them a full point. Yeah, it would have been nice to see exactly kind of where those those individual products 
we're at. We can see overall what Nevada did with sales and how bad tourism was, or, or I guess how much they rely on tourism. <laughs> right. Uh, and so without that, the, the sales dipped. And so it would have been nice to see who was still capturing that locally. What are the locals buying? That would have been nice to see. Um, all right, moving on to number seven. Did they create a summary with a call to action? Uh, being publicly traded, they can't really ask for money. But uh, in this pitch deck, they did kind of lay out a lot of their financials. Looked pretty solid to me. Uh, I agree. Um, they they are prevented from the traditional ask, but um, they gave me enough information that I can uh, inquire if I want more information. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a five and a half out of seven. That is a 79%. That's pretty damn good. Um, I think it was really quick. It was to the point. I think that they didn't waste a whole lot of slides that we've seen in the past. Um, and so like if an investor is going to open this up, I don't think they're wasting anybody's time to get right down to it. So some pretty good slides in there that, that we pointed out. Uh, if you've got a, a retail shop that you're looking at opening up, um, you know, in Arizona, for example, um, had a guy hit me up. He wanted to go from Idaho to uh, New Mexico. Um, so whatever your choice is, take a look at um, all of our tips, all of the previous um, videos that we've done. Got any questions? Let us know. So let's switch gears. We'll take a look at some kind of simple technical analysis on Planet 13 ticker symbol PLNHF. Uh, first thing I would do is I would go to over-the-counter markets. When you get to pink sheets, make sure that you're looking at the right ticker symbol. Anything that's five digits and ending in F is always an immediate red flag to me because I need to make sure that they have a registered transfer agent. And so you can see that they have a, a verified profile and independent directors. They don't, uh, it looks like they are not DTC eligible, meaning not this particular symbol is not eligible to trade electronically. Uh, so let's make sure we have the right ticker symbol. And we get to PLNHF, which does have a transfer agent verified. Very important because if you're on a particular platform like E-Trade, it may not allow you to buy or sell if it is not DTC eligible. Um, uh, some brokerage firms allow you to do that with a $75 buy and sell, which doesn't make sense when it's equivalent to a penny stock. Obviously, at uh, almost $7, it's not. But just uh, so you know, five digits ending in F, kind of a red flag for me. So at the C3 fund, we use an automated algorithmic trading software to do day trading. I'm just going to use Yahoo Finance, really simple, easy for some just real basic technical analysis using uh, the MACD or relative strength indicator uh, and other, other options there. 200 day moving average is going to be a, a good look to see when the bottom uh, might be in. And so for Planet 13, they've already reached that, that level uh, as a potential buy-in. So we're, we're green lit, looks okay. That price target we were looking at for a 200 day moving average is $6 and 34 cents. Um, there's a couple of bearish signals that we're taking a look at. If it falls below the 200 day moving average, um, that might be an issue, but there's plenty of bearish options that we're taking a look at. So I think short term looks like it's been consolidated for the most part with some long term potential on the upside. Looks like there might be an overbought stochastic on that as well. So might be some uh, some profit taking. The other thing I would take a look at is volume. Want to make sure that we're not going to move the markets. It only takes about six and a half million dollars to, to buy this whole market every day. 923,000 shares at 670 uh, doesn't take a whole lot of money to move that. So that's one thing I would be a little bit uh, cautious about as well. I'd also take a look to see if there's further continued consolidation that that 200 day moving average doesn't move down below five bucks. So if it moves from, you know, that that 630 to 490, um, that might be a new support line. So I would keep uh, I keep a, an eye on that. Fundamentally, I'm not sure fundamentals matter anymore, but it looks like there's some some decent news that they've had the best month ever reported in early April. So uh, it looks like they're rebounding significantly. And the other note too, is that their sales account for over 8% of the entire state's cannabis sales. They have two stores, I believe in Nevada, and they get 8.4%. I mean, that's insane. 
So on 420, Planet 13 reported results of over 20 million in revenues and 300,000 in adjusted EBITDA. That's the earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. In addition to 2020 results, they reported first quarter 2021 revenue of 23.8 million. So first quarter 2020 results included a record monthly revenue number uh, for March at 9.7 million, which is believed to be the beginning of record results for the company as you know, Nevada and Vegas in particular rebounds from uh, the lockdown. Florida saw it, you saw it with the, the um, college parties and everything for spring break. Um, a lot of other people are going to Vegas, uh, plenty of other people moving permanently, but you're seeing a lot of tourism rebounding and helping uh, cities like Las Vegas and tourism and cannabis are no different. So as tourism re returns to Las Vegas, they're going to open up a superstore, 55,000 square foot store in Santa Ana in the second half of 2021. So sometime after July. Um, and when they do that, there's going to be offering, like we mentioned, um, a chance for possibly consumption lounge, or if not, just kind of an Instagram experience, whatnot. Um, ultimately, the other thing I would take a look at as, as being an opportunity is um, if or when federal legalization happens, look to see who has the largest amount of labor. Um, real estate and labor cannot be written off because of a tax code called 280E. So I think there's an opportunity there if or when, not if, but when legalization happens at the federal level, there's going to be some huge increases in profitability as you see um, finally companies being able to write off labor and real estate. All right, keep a look on that MACD. There's a bear signal that happened on Friday, May 7th. Um, outside of that, this is not financial advice. <laughs> We're going to roll this one up. Uh, I want to thank my guest, Katrina Golgowski, angel investor and attorney. Thanks for being back on The Talking Hedge. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.